Hi everybody, thanks for joining us again. Um, on the chair today, I've got somebody that I've known for quite a while. Um, he was my schoolmate, but that's another story for another day. Like I was an elder when he went to school <laughs> with me, but now we are here. Anyway, um, I've got Untogozo. He's going to introduce himself. As we say on this platform, people introduce mm -hmm. themselves. But if you're finding us for the first time, please subscribe. Um, and the people who are our subscribers continue to comment, like, share. Let us know what you think of our mm -hmm. change conversations. Ntogos, nice mm -hmm. to have you on the chair today. Ah, and Poops, thank you so much. It's, it's such a pleasure to be on this platform. I've been actually wondering, when am I going to be part of this uh, great conversation? <laughs> so you should thank have you. told me that you want to be part of this conversation. <laughs> so, so thank you for inviting me and also like to greet uh, the, the people who watch this platform. Um, as Poops has said, yes, uh, so we kind of share like similar values and principles and outlook in life. Um, I always say, uh, I start with this, I am a child of God uh, and I am a father of three, uh, married for 17 years to my wife, uh, but we've been together for 22 years. So we, we are born with the uh, wow. <laughs> how, about my, how about she also? <laughs> yes. No, <laughs> no, most definitely more yeah, no, than I do. Um, so we've got a son, Alwande, who's 21 years. Um, and then we have a daughter, U U Netezego, who's 15. Then the younger one, uh, who's nine, U Zengelosi. So these are our little human beings that we have. Uh, so again, beautiful names. How do you come up with no, those names? Look, um, I, being a creative, I always want, uh, except for the for Lomdalo Alwan, because Gognale, Gognale, phase of people, you know, naming in, I know Alwan, the Awan, the Away to always. Oh, so we just, yes. So, so we just got caught up in that. But I said, going forward, look, let's give uh, our children names that are different so that they can feel what they are unique. But every time they say their names, I know, Ubani Kamalaka, Muneteze, wow, Muneteze. And I think I actually Googled uh, to find out who can I actually found nine. So it basically means it's our, uh, our child is the only one. But I know after that, there are many parents who've named their children Zengelos because they, 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 they actually like Hikamalak. So, and what does it mean for people that don't understand Zulu? Because, you know... Uh, Oh, yes, 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 yes. There's that too. Um, it's basically that she's, uh, she's uh, uh, guarded by the angels. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a gift that is guarded by, by the angels. But Tuzengelos actually means uh, 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 um, of the angels. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's basically, she, 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 when she came to earth, uh, her birth was uh, quite a difficult one, uh, which uh, is a long story uh, uh, um, I will share. Uh, some other time uh, for those who are interested but but yes we we it wasn't it wasn't easy uh, uh so she she had these guardian angels around her so that is how the name came about um mm -hmm. but who is Dogozo besides being a father i am a i call myself a, so, a serial entrepreneur uh because i i'm a business consultant uh that does um you know owns a company called mindset shift consulting uh, does training, facilitation, mentorship, and coaching. That's what the, those are the four pillars of the company. I'm a, I'm a, a co partner in another company called First Point uh, Consultants, uh, which does almost a similar thing. And uh, I'm an author. I'm an author of a book called Mindset Shift. Maybe you've seen this, maybe not, but this is a book that, <laughs> that I wrote um, a few years ago. Um, I've since written four books, but I, I still need to publish it. And I uh, don't know whether to share this or not, but um, Pums and I are also penning uh, something which will come through to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> Quite soon. Um, then I, I basically, I also write, a, a, I'm a columnist. I write for a, an Isi Zulu online newspaper called Umbele. 
and I'm also a social commentator. I just I just like discussing topical issues, thought provo- provoking topics, so that I just get you know to, to 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 get the feel of where people are, what's their thought pattern, and what what what's going on in the community. How do people think about certain things? So used to work for Unilever though. Uh, the last five years of my life. I used to work for Unilever. I, I, people always get shocked when I say this, that uh, I am a, I've got a qualification in, uh, in food science and technology. <laughs> so, so my background is in food science and technology. And five of those years I spent with Unilever uh, working as a process optimization manager, looking after their food factories in terms of uh, production efficiencies, machinery efficiencies, and commissioning of, uh, of machines. So that's basically what I did. And I really loved it until the entrepreneurship bug beat me 17 years ago. And here I am 17 years ago, still in it. Oh, wow. Oh, I didn't know you worked for Unilever. So, so I was a Unilever scholarship holder. Those are the people who yeah, who made, who took me to school. Like I would not, my parents would not have afforded for me to go to university, but then Unilever played a huge part. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where my first job was at Unilever. So I'm highly indebted to the Unilever, <laughs> to the Unilever. Um, and Unilever for me is just like that place where so much of, you get built, right? Yep, yep. Yep. I think, I think I always say to my friends or people that I meet, or actually I can easily identify a former Unilever person because Unilever is, even today, I call it a university, a corporate university where people get groomed. And that's why a lot of people get headhunted from Unilever. And a lot of people who've gone through Unilever have gone on to bigger things, either to become uh, directors, to become chairman, to run their own uh, companies uh, outside of Unilever. So I, I also, I myself to thank the, the level of leadership that I have uh, uh, and attribute it to, to having spent five years at Unilever. So I think we are birds of the same feather. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 we are. Um, and there's a lot I think that you can we can talk to just being able to to get scholarships and have and have somebody take a chance on you and you taking a chance on yourself. Because True. if you don't make it, that's the end of that, you know? Yeah. And yeah. and I highly appreciate that. That that's the route some of us went to. But yeah, yeah, thanks for thanks for being here. So you were a food sci- you did food science and technology. And yep. now you are running a business mm-hmm. in facilitation coaching and mentoring and training like like what happened <laughs> Talk to us <laughs> look uh, you know it's it's a funny thing um i always say as a person you are always you are only able to connect the dots going backwards because um i've always been an a student uh you know from primary school up to tertiary uh, so when I was, was studying food science and technology, I was uh, always part of the top two in the class. And um, when I finished, uh, I actually got a bursary from a company called National Brands Limited, which uh, owns uh, Bakers, um, the company that manufactures biscuits, your choice assorted and all the other types of biscuits. So I got a bursary for, 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 from them for, for good academic qualifications, I mean, uh, 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 scores. Then I did my in-service training with them. <clears throat> um, it was just me and another lady at the time. Her name was called uh, Janine, a white lady. So we were both taken and uh, did, uh, did the in-service training. But for some reason, they did not renew my contract and they renewed hers. And that was, this was back in 1996. And I was like, but how? How could it be that she, she, she gets her contract renewed? And for me, it was just, no, thank you. We, we don't have a space for you. And so now I was in this limbo where I didn't know what to do. And I said, okay, uh, let me find a job. And fortunately, I went back to my lecturers. I said, look, I, I, I don't have a job. It was January. I don't have a job. I need something uh, uh, to do something for the year. And they said, oh, we've got a, a position of a junior lecturer. Um, you know, 
uh, open in the department, would you be keen uh, to, to, to come join us? I was like, oh, yeah. And you're going to, if you become part of the staff, you're going to study for free. So that is when I got to do my, uh, my uh, bachelor's degree, you know, like the two-year bachelor's uh, after the diploma. Uh, so I joined because I was desperate for a job. And secondly, I, I needed something, you know, I, I just needed to, to earn a living. <clears throat> so I joined them. So for two years of my life, I was a junior lecturer. I was lecturing students my age and some people who, who were actually uh, part of the part of my they were they were former uh, <laughs> classmates. <laughs> so I came back and I I lectured them. I mean they trusted me that much and I and I was that that good, you know. So for two years I did this, but I hated the job. So I just said once I'm done, I get my my degree, then I'm out. <laughs> so so when they when they came back after two years and said, oh wow, you know, um, don't you want to do a master's? And I'm like, mm mm. <laughs> Sorry, that's not that's not where I want to go, and um, I'm 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 not renewing my contract. And where are you going to go? I said I don't know, but I am not renewing my contract. So after that, I why stayed did at you home. hated this? Why did you hate it that much? Because at the time I thought I was not crafted to become a teacher or a lecturer. You know, for me, I, I felt, okay, I'm a scientist in my head. I, I need to be somewhere in the factory, in the lab and doing this and that, mixing up things and blowing up things, you know. But I didn't see myself standing in front, uh, in front of uh, a group of people. By the way, I was very shy at growing up. I couldn't even, you know, for me, I would sweat when I have to give a speech, you know. Now, I'm mentioning that because it links to my purpose, why I'm here, where I am today. So you saw so people get to understand that, you know, uh, living a purposeful life is very important. Sometimes we will not see, but God will kind of create a way and force you into a situation. And then you'll only understand later. Uh, then my friends started getting married and they started asking me to, 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 to give speeches. Yeah. Propose, propose a toast. Yeah. Be, be a program director here. And I think for the first 10 weddings, I would sweat. I would sit and Google jokes and whatnot. Because <laughs> it, it, it was not me. Little did I know that God was making me comfortable giving uh, uh, presentations and, and speaking in front of people. So mm -hmm. after the 10th, I started being comfortable. I started realizing that, look, I'm not a comedian. So I'm not going to worry about uh, trying to find jokes to make people laugh. Let me just be a good presenter. So I started mm -hmm. working on my presentation skills in such a way that when I would be, uh, be a, you know, a director for the for, for a program director for one wedding, a straight, totally strange guy would come and say, you know, you've done so well, you, you know, your presentation, your, your, your directing skills are so immaculate. I would like you to be uh, my program director at my wedding. I'm getting married next year. And I'm like, but I don't know you, dude. How do you just... Uh, you know, <laughs> ask a person you don't know to direct your wedding. But then I soon started using that, that platform to my advantage. To date, I've been an MC, well, a program director of 45 weddings. 45 weddings. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. So, so fast forward. Um, when I shut down my manufacturing business of uh, manufacturing mobile fridges, which I ran for nine years, it was one of the wait, 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 uh -uh, wait, take <laughs> us back. You're jumping the gun. So you mentioned at some point that you were at Unilever. Those were the last five yes. years of you being corporate. Yes. So what makes you decide that you are not going to look for another job? You are going to leave corporate to go into business. So take us back there. Okay, let me go back there. I think um, I was at that department for five years and I'd pretty much done everything. And I'd gotten into a routine where it, it just became, you know, the same thing every week. When I say the same thing, the routine, not so much the work. The work was different because I was doing a lot of projects. But I felt this is just not me. I need something bigger, you know. I was getting frustrated and I had just been part of the exclusive uh, high performers uh, who, were, who, were, who, were, who were trained in the leadership, uh, the Unilever leadership program. So 
Uh, one of them actually was that's when I met U- Undumiso, uh, who was your classmate, Undumiso U- Umapolo. <laughs> so yeah. he was part of Unilever and we were at that same program together. Trust me, when I was doing that program, it was a year's program, there were these two um, facilitators. I didn't even know then that they were called facilitators, but they came through and I was watching them do this. And I was like, one day I would like to do this. You know, I looked at it, I was like, but how do you get to this point where you go to corporate companies and train people or facilitate and do this? Um, when the program was done, this, this lady came to me and said, um, you know what, I see something in you. You are going to do great things uh, in future. <laughs> but I just, I just didn't take notice of that. I was like, ah, you know, I think this is what facilitators do. They make you feel good. Um, we finished it around September and um, October, November, December, Jan- January, February, March. Six months later, I tendered my resignation uh, with Unilever because I felt, no, man, there's, 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 there's something bigger. I need to do bigger things and I'm being constrained here. I, I feel like a, a bird in a cage and uh, people need to see these colorful um, feathers of mine because right now it's just Unilever that is seeing it uh, and it so happened that at the time when I, and I, when I had this itch of feel fulfilling a bigger purpose one of my uncles approached me and said look um, um, I've just got a, a, a contract um, or, 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 or to, to, to when he, he, he's been given a contract by Chelsea to operate a Chelsea franchise uh, they had just built Umla's Mega City. And he said, no, do you mind coming through and be, being my partner? And I said, okay, fine. But I was, I was not sure. I said, okay, how much, do, how much is needed? And he said, it's 100,000 rands. I went straight to HR and said, okay, how, how, how much would I get if I resigned today? They did the calculation. They gave, they gave me the figure. And I'm like, okay. I'll be <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll be able to get the 100,000 rand needed. Uh, in a month's time and still be left with um, a bit more. I was like, okay, cool. Um, I came back. I went to my wife. I had a discussion with her. And I said, look, I'm thinking of taking this stance. And she said, um, okay, let's try and see. And on Monday, I went and tendered my resignation. I said, guys, they held on it for two weeks. Eh? <laughs> they held on it for two weeks. I said, no, there's no way you can resign. I even got a... I think the guy's name was Sitole at the time. He was one of the directors. I got a personal call from him. He was like, hey, Miel, what are you doing? <laughs> why, said, are you no, <laughs> yeah, why are you leaving? We've got great plans for you. You know, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm stagnant and I'm, I'm frustrated. I need something more. Then they offered me a position in Turkey uh, and Kenya. They said I must choose. And I was not prepared at all to move out of the country. I'd just gotten married at the time and uh, with uh, my son. Uh, So I was like, no, I can't take my family in a new country to start a new life because I think it was a secondment for two years. But I said, no, guys, I've made up my mind. I'm leaving. Uh, But look, I'm going for greater things. And that is how I, I kind of got out of corporate to pursue entrepreneurship. Uh, So for me, it was, uh, it was that stance. Yeah. Wow, bold! I have to say, I need to ask: Did the Chelsea franchise work out? Okay, so I, I then got into the Chelsea franchise. Remember, this is telecommunications. I know nothing about telecommunications, so I had to learn from scratch. Uh, I then kind of learned quickly, um, but then halfway through the, the the running of this franchise, it felt like I was I was back in corporate because. There were certain things that I, I couldn't do. Uh, there were, I was being told what to do, what not to do. I'll give you a simple thing. Um, the, the, the market that I operated in uh, is mainly 100% uh, Zulu speakers. But the pamphlets that we had to distribute are written in English. Now, this is what happened. Every time I would get people, you know, salespeople in the field to go and distribute the, the pamphlets, and people would still come back into our store and ask questions about the things that are already written on the pamphlet. Then for me, it said, there is a, there is a problem with interpretation. So I called her head office. I said, look, can you print the same pamphlets, but uh, translate them into Zulu? 
They were like, no, we can't do that. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to do it for all the other provinces and uh, it's going to be costly, blah, blah, blah. And I said, fine. And all the other I, languages and why yes, is it important? Yes, yes. <laughs> I can so, hear that so, conversation. So, <laughs> so I just got a graphic design and said, look, dude, just, just um, give me the same pamphlet, but everything in Isizu, I already translated it in Isizu. I gave it to him. He did it. We printed a, a thousand of these things. We started distributing. Now, this is what happened. Uh, people started coming in. They were no longer asking questions. They came in and said, I want package one. I want package two. I want package three. Because they were reading it in the language that they understand. Okay. So that, and then, you know, for some reason, I think we, with the business was not performing well because uh, the, the area that I was operating in, the credit score of, 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 of them of the community or the people was not that good. So you would sign up 300 people, probably get uh, only 10% of those approved. Whereas my other fellow uh, franchisees uh, would sign up, um, uh, would sign up 300 people and get like 90% of those approved. And, uh, you know, because of the geographical area. Uh, and it started causing tension between me and my, uh, and my uncle at the time. And I felt, look, um, I'd rather forsake the business relationship and keep uh, our relationship, uh, uh, you know, intact and good. Uh, so that is how I then I, I kind of uh, excuse myself from the partnership. And I did it. I, I just gave them um, uh, the, the, my shares away without selling them because I mean they didn't they were not worth much anyway. But I just said, look, uh, I'm just gonna you know just get me out of the of the of the partnership. And that is when I started moving into uh, mobile fridge manufacturing. Oh, okay. So, so what are the things, because you, you called yourself a serial entrepreneur, what are yeah. the things that you wish you could have been told before you even started the entrepreneurial route? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I so wish when I wanted to do the, the transition from corporate to being self-employed, I got a mentor because that would have actually half the problems that I encountered after that. I mean, I think for, for a good decade, I was, just, I was just, you know, shooting in the air and hoping to, to hit the target. Uh, I had to learn things from scratch. My mistakes cost me a lot because uh, I didn't know what I didn't know. And, uh, you know, uh, it just became difficult moving forward. Uh, you would do this and it would cost you, uh, you know, quite, quite a lot. I mean, I lost money, like 100,000 rand in that, in that partnership. Then I got into another partnership uh, in, the, in the mobile fridge manufacturing space uh, with a partner. And for four years, I think four or five years down the line, uh, we split and I was left with almost like a 2 million rands debt that I had to take care of. Now, all these things kind of set me back. But I know now, knowing what I know now as a mentor and a coach, I teach people how not to do this. And I, and I kind of take people by the hand, not really take them by the hand, but kind of guide them and show them, look, don't do this. It will cost you. Do this this way because it will take you half the time that it's going to take you. Sometimes... People want to do things because they understand that, uh, no, this is the only way it's been done this way, but it will actually take you twice as much to achieve your goal. But if you have a mentor, then it will take you probably a quarter of the time. So that is one thing that I wish I could have gotten uh, when, I, when I did the transition. Wow. Yeah, I think I've always believed in, in this is Zulu, sitting there, right? Yep, yep. I've always believed in just asking. I've, I've, it's the one thing I think, I've, I don't know where I got it from, but for me, asking and getting guidance has always come easier. Um, yeah. There's never been a sense of, oh, but yes. I should know better, you know, because those are some of the things that, that you, you, you think about. The, hence, most people might not even take the route to be asking questions. So, yeah. so I, I really understand that because you don't know what you don't know. How about you ask somebody who's literally walked the journey? 
yes. and see if yes. they can help you. And what I and find is that people are very willing to share. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, look, uh, if you've been through the mill, then you, I mean, you, you, you've got the stripes, you've earned the stripes, and uh, the only thing that you can do is to share so that other people don't get into the same into the same uh, uh, problem, you know. Uh, so coaching and mentorship is so important. I don't know why in the in, in the black community, especially, we do not see this as important. Because if you look at any other field, uh, they for sports, there is a there is a coach, there's a manager, whatever they call them, uh, who who makes sure that the team plays well. Every other sport has a coach, tennis, rugby, uh, motorsport, and, and there are coaches there. Um, and, and, and in different fields, you have people who coach uh, certain people, you know. So, but in business, for some reason, we think that we can wing it, you know. Uh, but I know that in other communities, like the white community and the Indian community, there's always a coach, there's always um, a succession plan. And that's why we, we, we always see even in our communities, um, uh, family businesses, they, they fold after a time when, when the, 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 the person who started it uh, is no more, you know, or has yeah. lost interest or is in retirement. It's purely because there is no proper succession plan and there is no coaching. So I think um, this is very important in our community and in, in us achieving what we need to achieve in businesses. Yeah. So, so what are the... I'm going to say five things, but I know there's a lot. What are the five things that you would like somebody to know before or some things that you consider important for somebody to start a business? Things that people must really consider before they start a business. Even if it's a side hustle, somebody's still working, but they want to do something on the side or they are transitioning out of corporate and planning to get into business. What are minimum five things? Okay. The, the, the one, the first one that I would say is you, you need to know yourself first. What kind of a person are you? Okay. What kind of a person are you? Are you, are you a strategist? Are you a hands-on person? Are you a thinker? Are you, so you, you just need to do like a self-analysis, do some introspection. Because we, we work in these companies and we do one type of work for like 10, 15 years. And then we think we are gurus in what we do. And we only know that part of the business. But when once you want to, to transition into self-employment, you will now be responsible for every other for every other department. So are you good at managing people? Are you good at uh, communications? Are you good at, 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 at working with people? Or are you alone? Are you prefer doing special projects? So know who you are, okay? That's the first one. So you need to do a psychoanalysis and find out what your interests are, okay? Because uh, some people you'll find they will get into, into the engineering projects or pro projects, yes. But you find that they are not cut out for the for the engineering space they'll probably do more selling coffee you know starting a coffee <laughs> a coffee shop okay so you, you you then basically do that then secondly is after everything that you've gone through find out what your purpose in life is what is your passion what are you passionate about you know uh, I, I realized early enough that uh, I like sharing information, but I didn't, I didn't know this. I would, I would share information with friends and people, but I didn't know that it, it was an exchange of information. That's why when I say uh, later on we link why I had to start by, by, by lecturing, because I think God was preparing me for the platform that I'm occupying now. So, but I didn't see it then. Okay. And when I was doing uh, directing a, a program director at my friends, different friends' weddings, he was teaching me presentation skills, how to deal with people, how to understand people, the mannerisms, the approach, the art. So that is basically it. So find out what you're passionate. What are you passionate about? Something that you can do uh, even in the wee hours of the morning. If somebody wakes you up, you, you won't even have to blink an eye, an eyelid uh, to do that. You can wake me up at two in the morning and give me a slight deck. I would wake up and do a presentation. You know, that is how passionate about, uh, about it. Uh, and, and also mentorship and coaching. So that's the second one. 
Then the third crucial one is the why. Why do you want to get into business? <laughs> because a lot of people find that they actually get into business because they are being pushed into getting into business. The circumstances are no longer allowing them to be where they are. And they think that getting going the self-employment route is the easiest. You know, I'll be able to control my time. But if you, if you want to go the self-employment route, you need to be disciplined yourself. You need to be self-controlled. If you are not disciplined and self-controlled at work, trust me, your business will never amount to anything because you will take the same practices that you apply in your workspace and go and apply it in your business. You, if you don't keep time, then you're going to be the first one that they don't keep time. You're not going to report on time. Your employees are going to follow suit because they see you. But if you are a disciplined individual, then people are going to uh, look up to you and then they will buy into your, into your uh, vision. Okay, so that's the third one. Uh, and then the what? So what do you want to do? Okay, you've now established why you want to get into it. It may be the circumstance. It may be the passion. Uh, that that actually lead you. I prefer the, the the latter, which is the passion. I'd rather have you go into a field where you're passionate about, but with a bit of a balance, than uh, because of a a situation. Because once well, once you go because of a situation, you are always working under pressure. You know because you have to meet certain standards. You have to do this and that. But passion. Um, even if things go bad, you will still stick it around, you know, stick around and, and, and try and do it. Now, the, the why is done and the what. Then the, the what is, what is it that you want to do? Now, we find people saying, no, I want to be a jack of all trades. There's no such. You can't be a jack of all trades. You need to establish what field, what do I want to do? Why do I want to go there? Obviously, we've answered that. But what is it that I want to do? Do I want to be in the training space? Do you want to be in the project management space? Do you want to be in the, in the commerce space? Do I want to be in the operation space? Where do I want to be? Then that's the what, okay? Then um, the, the last one is when, 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 when do I want to start? And when do I want to achieve this? You know, uh, so there must be a timeline. You can't get into business and, and simply think, I'm going to get into business uh, I'm going to see what's going to happen. Have timelines. When I got into uh, the telecommunication, telecommunications business, one year was enough for me. After a year, I said, no, this is not for me. Then I, I skipped and went into, into um, uh, the manufacturing of mobile fridges, mobile toilets, and mobile kitchens. There, I said, I'm going to spend a decade um, you know, uh, building this up into something that uh, is a formidable company. Uh, but unfortunately, I only was able to do nine years because after nine years the business folded. But at least I had learned enough in the in the in the oper in the in the manufacturing space to be able to help other people. I proudly say this that um, I was one of the people that actually started the whole mobile fridges industry in South Africa. Um, uh, you know, I made it fashionable. I built a company from nothing to something. And, and a lot of people can actually attest. I mean, I sold close to 3,000 of those things in the different parts of the provinces. I sold them to five countries in the African continent. Um, I traveled to 12 countries in, in, in Africa just because of that business. So I, I kind of, even though I'm not no longer part of the industry, but I pride myself uh, in that. So the last one is the when. When do I start? When is When are things going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I really love what you're, what you're saying because sometimes we get caught up with um, what is happening around us. So you've got a friend who is selling, I don't know, whatever, and you think you must also do that, right? Yeah. And you don't take the time to say, what is it that I'm passionate about? And so that because when you're passionate about something, there's an enjoyment that comes with that. Yeah. And yes. even when you are facing challenges, there's there's something that is driving you that is bigger than just um, the fact. It's bigger than you to a, to a point. So that yep. passion usually usually helps. And you don't want to be doing business in an industry that you might not even appreciate because exactly. you're going to hate. You're yeah. going to hate every minute of it. 
<laughs> so so I, I really I really get that part of it. I really get that. Yeah. Like I would say, like I loved my tenor at, 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 at Unilever. I really loved it. Yeah. But as I was, and and you know, I've changed, I've changed careers. So I was also in finance when I was at Unilever. Yeah. But as I, I got to understand very quickly that finance wasn't my passion, and at some point I got to understand that the FMCG space was not the space that I was very passionate about. Yeah. So yeah. even when you are mm-hmm. in 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 um in corporate for you to be able to understand which industries you're passionate about becomes a very critical thing because then you're able to channel your career or even channel your business in, in the things that you, to love, you love doing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think those are great points that you shared, but tell me what are the mistakes that you've witnessed people do when it comes to business or maybe even the mistakes that you think you've made that you'd like to share? Because we have to learn from failure, right? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, and, and, you know, if I may add, failure is necessary in your Thank advancement you. in business. It is necessary. Don't look at it um, as, a, as a drawback. It is necessary. It's part of your growth. Accept it, embrace it, take the learnings from it and move on. It's the only way we learn things uh, effectively and quicker, um, as opposed to achievements. Okay. Now, the, 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 there are a couple of things that I think, uh, you know, are the mistakes that one made is, um, firstly, I was not really good at, uh, which I still, I uh, still am not, uh, in, 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 in finance management. So I could not separate business uh income to my personal income so whenever i you know i made money in the business and i was like you know what uh things are bad at home uh so i'm gonna take from the business and then use the business account uh, and not pay myself a salary or even advance myself a a, a you know a, a loan uh you know to, to so the one thing that i think was the biggest mistake is that I, I didn't put structures in place because that's the very first thing that, that's important. You have to put structures in place. You must understand that you are not an HR person. You are not a, a, an accountant. You are not, <laughs> you are not a, a, a sales and marketing guru. So therefore, you either outsource all those or you get people, you hire people to do that so that you build structures around yourself. And then you but only there was, give... there was a wait, 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 wait. <laughs> You're starting out. How are you hiring salespeople and outsourcing? Yo, uh, you're starting out. This is you. How are you going to pay? Trust me. Now, this is the thing. We always think that we can wing it uh, and, and, and make it as we move along. But the, the, the price that you pay is too costly. So rather invest whatever money you have. Even if you get somebody and say, look, I, I do not have money right now, but I need your, your expertise in, in, or at least your guidance in sales and marketing or bookkeeping. Uh, I, I, will, I will pay a stipend or whatever, 500 rands a month, just so that you, you do this right for me. Okay. Now, remember, this was, this was a time before all the the smartphones and the and the apps that we have that actually do these things. So I think I'm speaking in the now. In the now, you you basically at times don't need to, to approach an accountant. I mean, you can download one of the apps uh, that can actually do this for you. So invest in that. Subscribe to those apps. They will actually help you run your business seamlessly and effectively. But the point that I'm trying to, 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 to say is uh, if you do not have the money for it, find a program that can help you uh, get the required skills or that can actually, there are things that are called non-financial support. So there are programs like CEDA and many others who actually will pay an accountant for you or will pay a sales and marketing person to do the job for you, but you don't pay anything. So it's a grant that they give. So try by all means to find out what is it in my space, in the business development space that I can get to help advance my business. Because if you do not do that, then you will find yourself having to fight fires 
all the time, you know. So that is one. And secondly, which is the biggest uh, problem, uh, fortunately, I didn't have it. But a lot of people that I see a biggest mistake. You come out of a company, you are the guru, you are this guy who's been making things happen. And then you think that when I run my own business, I'm going to, you know, uh, operate at the same level. Now, things change when you move from uh, corporate to being self-employed. There's like a whole dynamic shift because it's two different environments. In this part, you are, you are kind of, you know, embedded in a system, a structure, and where everybody does everything, and they make you look good. It's just like in a field, in a soccer, in a soccer match. Ronaldo, yes, Ronaldo is good, but he is, he is as good as his teammates, you know? So he shines because his teammates are able to play to his strengths. That is what we do in corporate. But take Ronaldo and put him in a bad team. I mean, not bad. I mean, uh, 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 what's this? Manchester United that he's playing for. It, it, Manchester is not the best of teams, you know, these days. They used to. And you can see that, that he's really struggling because he has to carry the entire team. Now, that is what happens when you move from corporate to uh, uh, being self-employed. You then become the person that carries the entire team because everybody's looking upon you to do certain things. Now, it will test your people management skills. So if you are not good at people management and you do not have good communication skills, then you are also going to always be fighting fires. So I think those are the two biggest mistakes that people make. Yeah, I think I think the, the example that you're making about when you've been in corporate, there's a structure and a support, right? That is there. Yeah. And, and now you are on your own and you need to figure it out. And I was laughing. I was telling a friend of mine and I had this conversation with my former CEO who also left the business and I had lunch with him. And he says yeah. to me, Pons, I have to worry about the damn PC, my <laughs> laptop. If something goes wrong, I have to worry about my laptop. Because now there's no phone in IT and the guys are here to fix it now. And when I was starting as well, I was like, oh my God, there's no IT to call. You need to figure it out. Or you exactly. must have your own IT person that you must call, your outsource person. So yep. those things you don't think about, right? Yeah. And also when it comes to data management, because we don't think, we don't think about these things. You, you're using your laptop and you're storing things here. Then one day they break into your car, they take your laptop and your business just collapses like that because every information that you had uh, was in that laptop. Now you need to then start to think beyond an employer or an employee. You need to start thinking at a strategic level, at an executive level. So how do we mitigate risk? How do we minimize risk? You know, so you start putting things in place and say, Okay, now if I if I let me tell you how how I I, I because I I I I was robbed of my 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 entire office equipment. So it was my laptop, my iPad, my phone. So I lost almost everything. Then that's a lesson that I learned when I was running the other business, the mo the mobile fridges business. Then I learned that I may not have a a a backup like a cloud space. This was before the, the, the cloud space storage and stuff. So I started buying the external hard drives. I've got about three of them. So this is what I do. Every week I, 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 up, I, I update, you know, I store uh, in all the three. So I've got, uh, I've got, I've got stuff in my, in my, in my, in my uh, tablet. I've got stuff in the iCloud, uh, Google Drive, and I've got these three, uh, external hard drives that are put in different places. So just in case anything happens, then that is how I'm able to mitigate the risk of losing information. Now, you need to start to think like that or store everything in the cloud. But I also caution that because we've seen what COVID-19 has done. It has just changed the entire landscape. And I say to people, uh, one of the books that I've written is the next biggest virus that is going to collapse uh, uh, industries in the world is, uh, is, a, is a technology virus or an IT virus. Because once we are not able to access our, um, our, our information in the cloud, 
then you'll see people going crazy. I mean, remember sometime last year, I think it was last year or two years back, they, I think it was WhatsApp or Facebook shut down for like a couple of hours and yeah. the people went mad. They, they were really panicking and businesses could not run. I mean, that two hours was crucial and a lot of businesses lost money. So I also, you know, step with caution when I talk about, uh, when I talk about IT and, I, and, the, and storing in the cloud make sure that you've got either servers or you've got uh, external hard drives, but just make sure that you spread your eggs in different baskets. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's good advice because even, you know, we, we rely so much as well on social media, on those yep. people that are following us. But when you think about it, we don't actually have databases of those, of, of those people. We don't have email databases of all those people. And if if Meta, Meta, whatever they're called now, the Facebook yeah. group could shut down a lot, a lot of business are out of. Are out we of. are done. I I, I, I are said so this. reliant on on them for for reaching yeah. out to clients. It's and I always say, uh, yeah, I, I sorry to 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 get into 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 to your mouth, but I, I I say there are people who proud them pride themselves as uh, influencers. It's like I've got. This following 3.4 million, 4 million, 5 million people. But the saddest thing about it is that you do not have control of any of those uh, numbers that follow you. Because if your account gets stolen, then you no longer become an influencer. So your survival is dependent on what uh, Meta does. Uh, do they still allow you to, to, to operate your account? And I've had people, I mean, we've seen recently uh, Twitter, uh, uh, barring Trump from uh, from his account, which had millions of followers. And, you know, there are many others. So these tech giants have got control. Now, how do you then leverage that beyond just what you have? And say, yes, I'm an influencer, but what else do I do on the side that I can control so that when they take this away, I still am able to, to, to be an influencer that I call myself? Wow. Yeah, no, I think... I think the landscape has totally changed um, from just selling soap over the counter to, to the technology effect that really makes a huge difference in our lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, 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 it has. We're living, uh, we're living in a world where you need to be techno-savvy because if you are not techno-savvy, you are going to battle. Uh, I, I, I still see people... Um, uh, wanting to go inside the bank and, and do certain things. And when I do these trainings and I tell people that I haven't been inside the bank in the past three years, they're like, but how do you operate? I say, the only thing I need in my life is my smartphone or access to, to online or the internet. That's all I need. Uh, I do banking using my apps. I do payments using my apps. And soon, uh, we are going to become cashless. So people who, who are dependent on, on handling cash and whatnot, you will actually see the whole uh, uh, financial uh, security or guarding industry disappear right in front of your eyes. Because as people move into cashless um, uh, 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 you know, society, I mean, there won't be a need for, for, for these um, uh, armored trucks to move money around, you know? So things are changing at a, at a very fast pace and we need to move with uh, the changes. Yeah. So, so we speak about self-employment, which is the biz business element. And you find a lot of people that call themselves small micro businesses. And how do people transition? There's an element of I'm self-employed, I'm in a small business. But yeah. ideally, you want to build a business that is sustainable, that grows, and that's bigger. That, that then takes you out of the small um, business element. How do you transition your mind? And how do you make sure that you, you can grow? Because I always say, if, you're, if the business is dependent on you and solely you, what happens? We go yeah. back to the story where when Ubaba, whoever has passed on, that's the end of that, right? Yep, yep, yep. Look, uh, um, they, besides the transition from corporate to self-employment, 
because the the only difference between what you are doing, what you were doing, and what you are doing is that you were self you were employed then with structures in place. Then you transitioned to self employment, which basically means you are still employed by your business. But now the the only difference is that you have to build the structures that will sustain the business. So it goes back to the point that you asked earlier. That says, what is the first thing that you do? You start building structures that will sustain the business beyond you. So once you build that and you and you employ competent people to run those structures, then the business starts to operate on its own. Look at it this way. I always give a simple example. When you bring a baby into the world, I think the first year you have to do quite a lot. You have to make sure that you feed the baby, uh, you know, you bath the baby, you do everything because the baby can't do anything. And, and the baby starts to learn certain things, learn certain mannerisms, learn set, how to walk, how to do this and that and that. Once the baby starts to run, then you are quite confident that, okay, now I can let go of certain duties that I do. So you treat your business as such. You start putting putting uh, structures in place. And then when you see that the business is actually able to operate without you for a day, for two days, for five days, for two weeks, for a month, because the, the aim is to move away from working in your business and work on your business. And a lot of us actually transition from corporate and then we are stuck in self-employment where we have to be at work every day of our lives. You must always um, uh, work towards working out of your business uh, to a point where you are able to create a, a or establish a business, then let other people run it for you, and then you start another one. That's why I call myself a, a serial entrepreneur because um, you know writing a book and selling a book is in its own a, a business. I've got a publishing, my own self-publishing company that does the 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 the, 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 the you know the publishing of my books. Um, I recently started a, uh, a, 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 a leisure and, 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 and gym wear brand called Big Sword, um, which is another business that, I'm, that I've started um, with the aim of giving it uh, to my son to run it at some stage. Uh, and then I do, I do, I have a, a business consultants and advisory uh, a business. Then I'm also a co-partner in another one. So I'm able to, or then I've got another uh, business that I started. It's called Starbucks, where I've put, um, you know, a number of black authors together. It's a platform that I've, I've created for, for, for black authors to, to market their books. So I've been able to do this because I learned from one business of how to start a business, grow it, and then let go of the business. Now I'm able to do that over and over again. So you need to get to that point where you're able to start develop and let go, start, develop and let go. And that is how you then become a serial entrepreneur because running a business, once you know how to do it, it's quite simple. You apply the same principles. It doesn't matter the industry. You apply the same principles. The development stages are the same. It, the, the only thing that may differ is the industry. So you need to learn what industry you are in. So eventually I would like to get to a space where I just become an investor. I no longer have to start anything. I just identify businesses with a good growth opportunity. Then I, I, I just invest in them. Yeah, I think that's the best, best space to be at. I always say, I want to sit on the side of the pool and <laughs> the money just, keep, the money just yeah. keeps flowing into my account. Yeah. There needs to be yeah. dip, 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 and I'm good. <laughs> that is where... That is where everyone should actually uh, you know uh, aspire to to go where you are you can you can do anything and go anywhere in the world and your businesses keep operating and money keeps coming through into your account then that's what you call uh, you would have achieved really once you get to that point but it takes it takes a lot of time you have to build the wealth then take that wealth and then invest it back into buying equity in a number of businesses yeah, yeah. thanks so, so tell me, are there any books that have kind of helped you? Um, you know, we, we, want, we want mentors, we want coaches. 
but there's also yes. books that really help you just to understand, get different perspective. Are, are there any books that you can recommend? There, there is one written by, um, uh, well, it's, it's mainly for small businesses. I think it will help people who want to get to understand the A to Z of, of running a business. It's called the Small Business Handbook by uh, Noah Zimzobe. Um, I, think, I think she, out of all the books that I've read, she articulated the small business industry in South Africa very well. It, it's a well-researched book which takes you deep into every aspect of running a business. Um, there's another one called Business Development. It's just that I read that like almost 15 years ago. I've forgotten who the author is, but it's Business Development. It's, it's got like a, a bluish cover if anyone wants to Google it. Um, and and, and I, I also think it helps to read biographies of business people. Uh, because I think from that, you, you, you get these uh, nuggets of, um, of uh, information that you need and where people share their experiences. Because every b- successful business person, it, I don't care, it doesn't matter whether it's a billionaire, multimillionaire, has had failures in their lives. Now, for you to not do, uh, you know, run through the same thing, rather learn from people who've gone through it. So read a lot of, 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 bio, of, of biographies by business people, um, mainly, mainly in the African continent. I, you know, the others are good, you know, European, American, they are good. But I've, I've read quite a few of your, your Trump books and uh, um, um, who's the guy, the virgin uh, um, uh, uh, active guy. Um, come again. Richard Branson. Yes, Richard Branson. But uh, their perspective on how to start a business and the circumstances are totally different from what we experience in the African continent, especially in South Africa. I mean, um, as a South African business person, you, you will battle to, 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 with the network, with ESCOM. Uh, shutting down because we, we are not able to operate. You will battle with having access to internet, things that they didn't have to worry about. Uh, and, and so it, 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 it gives a perspective of the American way of doing business. Rather than uh, follow people who, who are in your country or the continent of Africa, then you are able to navigate through building a business easier than you would if you didn't read those books. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for sharing. So what oh, is by the, the one way, thing? Yeah. And, 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 and this one too, mindset shift. I also talk about, <laughs> I also talk about my business failures and I take people through how I, 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 I made it through and I overcame certain things. So it's a good book to read if I have to say so myself. <laughs> okay, we will. Um, and thanks for the copy. I got your copy. I've I've literally done my first few chapters, so yeah. I'm, I'm getting there. I will, I'll go through it. No, 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 no crying as yet. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still when you are growing up. Stages. Okay. All right. Yeah. The, the juicy part. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Thomas, thank you for, for taking the time. So where do people find you on social media? Okay, um, on Instagram, I'm Dogozo underscore Biela. Uh, on social, what's this thing? Facebook, um, I am Dogozo Monte Biela. Uh, I will, however, be, be opening my TikTok page under uh, the handle, uh, the Mindset Shift Coach, because I think that's where I can add value more than I do in other platforms. In other platforms, like Instagram, it's a private account, so really... I just share my my you know my my stuff with friends. Uh, my Facebook page, uh, I've reached the limit of five thousand, and uh, possibly people will just have to follow me. But with uh, TikTok, I think uh, that's where I'll get to engage um, as the mindset chief coach and also share quite a lot of things. Yeah, thank you. Really, I really appreciate your time and thank you for 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 sitting here with me and having this conversation. It is my pleasure, and thank you so much for the for the invitation. And uh, if there is second round, well, I'm available. 
uh, <laughs> you <yeah>, probably <laughs> probably will come back and and um, and introduce the book that you're writing together. <laughs> no, we will. We'll definitely because <laughs> it's a book, but it's not a book. So we'll yes. just say that. You know, yeah. people <laughs> people will have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no thank, thank you so you much uh, thanks Holmes. thank you so much yeah yeah so yeah. for anybody who has been listening please make sure that you like comment really share with other people if you did find this conversation um useful thank you mm-hmm.